kids and them being treated for illness at school. Schools are kind of the front lines when it comes to cold, when it comes to flu. Your kids go to school, and guess who responds to those illnesses? School nurses. We've got Denise Kaufman from the Toledo Public Schools joining us today. She is a registered nur nurse, also uh, with the Toledo Public Schools. Thank you so much for being here with us. You're welcome. You have been with Start High School for the past couple of years. You've yes. been with Toledo Public for uh, well over a decade, I believe, if I've got my yeah. facts and figures yeah. correct. We wanted to bring you on here today because I told you I saw a report that had to do with Cleveland schools starting up health clinics to try to answer to what has been a growing call uh, for, I guess, medical professionals to be there at the schools. We're not at clinic status here in Toledo, but you say there has been, over the years, a growing call for definitely needing help in these schools when it comes to nursing. Well, I think that full-time school nurses, you know, is something that should be looked at. Um, it is not state mandated that we have um, school nurses in any building, um, but when you put a licensed school nurse in the building, they are able to um, do much more than um, if the nurse was sharing their mm -hmm. job between multiple schools. Um, school nurse is the only health professional that is in the building. Um, so staff go to them, students go to them, and they're the ones that are looked up to. One of the things that we've heard over the years, obviously Ohio and Ohio schools deal with levies, trying to support funding as far as the schools are concerned, but time and time again, nursing's one of those things that maybe gets cut back. It's something that maybe uh, you don't have a nurse there full time. Right. How does it work in our, our schools here locally as far as having somebody on staff? You mean as far as a school nurse? Yeah, I mean most of the high, TPS high schools, they right. all have, you are TPS, at Start High School. Yep, TPS high schools all have a full-time school nurse. Uh, most of the junior highs do also. Uh, between the elementaries, they have um, nurses that might have one, two, or three buildings. So those nurses are juggling. When the nurses are not in the building, then it leaves the um, illnesses up to administration, the passing of medications. Um, and deciding whether to send your student home or not. Mm -hmm. So um, it puts a lot on administrators. It takes time away from the, what they can do. It takes time away from the teachers because the teachers are assessing the kids and saying, oh, geez, do you put your head down, yeah. you know. Do I need to send you home? Then they're going down to the secretary, and the secretary's ultimately making some of those decisions. This all kind of came to a head, too, over the last couple of weeks. Obviously, we've been doing stories here about the flu outbreak. Mm -hmm. Just this past week, uh, a local school, an academy, had to uh, close for two days because they had a rampant illness uh, affecting students there. It, it's not just, and I, and I have to steal from an NPR report that came out just a couple of weeks ago saying it's not boo-boos and band-aids anymore no, for these school nurses, is it? No, it isn't. It's, it's, it, is it typically the, uh, the mom or the dad going in to help, or does there need to be a health professional in that office? There needs to be. Uh, you know, I advocate for licensed school nurses. NASN advocates for licensed school nurses. The Ohio. Tell, tell folks what that is. Exactly. A licensed school nurse. No, I'm sorry, the NASN. Oh, the, I'm sorry, the National Association of School Nurses is an organization. I don't know how many members, but they're an association of uh, nurses throughout the whole country. Mm -hmm. And then there's a division of them, which is the Ohio Association of School Nurses, which is an organization. We've got both of these. I wanted to interrupt. We've got both of these pulled up on our website uh, or on uh, the internet right now to show you there at home. This is uh, a look at the NASN website right there. And then you just mentioned the Ohio Association mm -hmm. of School Nurses as well. Yes. Of which you are a member. I'm a member. I'm on the board member. I'm, a, I'm the secretary for them. Um, and there's approximately 500 nurses that belong to OASN. And then we also have a, a regional organization, the Northwestern Ohio Association of School Nurses. And what happens is you can be a nurse in the school, working in the school, but you cannot use the term that you're a school nurse mm -hmm. unless you have a pupil personnel school nurse licensure through the Ohio Department of Education. Yeah. And these nurses start out as a registered nurse. Um, most of them have a bachelor's degree. And then they go on and they get further education. Uh, University of Toledo is where I graduated from. 
and I have a Master's of Education with a school nurse certification. There are other online schools that these nurses can take, and it really focuses um, their education on what happens, how to provide health care in an educational setting. So what it's we're, much different. So what we're seeing in Cleveland, and, and, and I know Cincinnati is also possibly implemented or re-implemented. I think they scaled back mm -hmm. for a time because of budget constraints, but re-implemented uh, re -implemented these clinics. Uh, is this something we will see in Toledo? Describe how you understand these things working. Well, because you uh, guys, you are on the front lines. Right, right, we are. And it would be wonderful, but funding is not there for that. It, you know, everybody would love to have a doctor in the school, yeah. but who's going to pay for that? Is this essentially having a walk-in clinic in a school? Is the, that more, more the, or less what it is? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. We have a physician who uh, donates her time over at Scott High School, and she's there a half a day. So the school nurse, you know, grounds up the students who need this care or need these immunizations and is able to then, this physician is able to see them and keep these students in school. Um, a lot of our underprivileged kids, uh, I, I think I, I have a number that there's seven million children in the United States without health care. Mm -hmm. So the school nurse is ultimately their number one health care provider. Yeah. Parents send kids to me all the time and say, call me, let me know what you think. Could you check his blood pressure three times a week? We have a lot of obesity, we have diabetes. Um, you know, it'd be wonderful if we could have a clinic in every school building, but the funding just isn't there. Um, a while back, ProMedica did some um, a clinic, but you know, then right. the budget goes away right. and um, it's not there. Is this so. a situation though, can you write prescriptions? No, absolutely not. Okay. No, licensed school nurses are, can just do their assessments and refer. We do a and lot is it hard sometimes making, if, if you have parents who are sending to the school nurse mm -hmm. saying, please check this kid for this, that, and the mm -hmm. other, uh, making them understand, I'm sorry, I cannot give you antibiotics, right. I cannot do right. this. I, I think school nurses do a wonderful job of knowing what is an urgent need and what isn't. And they have very good advanced assessment skills. Yeah. I just went to the Ohio Association of School Nurse Conference. We had a whole morning on a skills lab, how to do tube feedings to students because you don't often, you get them in your schools, but not everybody has them. So that, and that student might change and then uh, the other nurse might need to update herself on those skills. You brought up diabetes, you brought up obesity. Mm -hmm. Chronic illnesses is something that you are dealing with more and more, yes? Every day, every How single bad is day. It? Well, um, we have a lot of students. The, the students all can come to school, so we have uh, multi-handicapped, um, multi-disabled classes, and many times those students need a tube feeding during the day. The, they need catheterizations. Um, it keeps the school nurse pretty busy. So, in addition to your first aid, your bandies, your sports injuries. You know, I'm doing those things too. We also are mandated to do hearing and vision tests by the state. So we, and if all special needs kids get hearing and vision also. So we really see everything from the moment you walk in to the time you leave. And it's, you know, just overwhelmingly busy. But all those students deserve to have somebody that can take care of them. They deserve to be able to come to school. You're painting this picture of from 8 until 4, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm getting the hours right, but uh, within yeah. reason, obviously, <laughs> some days earlier, some days uh, later. later. <laughs> yeah, but within those hours, just a continual m uh, train mm -hmm. in motion, yes? It is. It is. It is a continual train, and you might have emergencies in between. The other day, I had a student who had an unknown peanut allergy and came in and had ate a peanut butter cookie and her tongue was swelling. So at that point, you really have to, you know, do a, a thorough assessment, know that you need to call 911. Yeah. There's um, a house bill out there right now. It's almost passed, I believe it's into the Senate, um, which will allow epinephrine to be stacked in schools. And um, in the event that there is a student that has an unknown allergy because we are seeing 
there was an 18% increase in food allergies between 97 and 2007, mm -hmm. and peanut allergies have doubled. I was at a conference with Dr. Gupta, and she said that out of one classroom, there's two children who have food allergies. Something so, else you've got to watch for. Talk yes. about in our remaining minutes, uh, training, and, and, and once again, the, the picture you're painting, does it tend to keep nurses or, or potential nursing students away from responding to school issues? Um, you mean of wanting to be a school nurse? Yes. I think a lot, of, a lot of nurses would like to become school nurses. I don't think that the education prevents it. Um, I think the funding is not there um, to put them in the schools. Mm -hmm. So a lot of school districts look to should we have clinic aides and they are very helpful and a lot of times they are the eyes and the ears for the school nurse but everybody must remember you need to be a registered nurse to be to be there to be the direction yeah they can't work autonomously in a school an lpn cannot work autonomously in a school they have to be directed by a physician or a registered nurse how many kids you oversee um Start has about 1,500. 1,500 kids. Yeah. One of the Very things, busy. the other thing we wanted to point out, and, and we were talking about these chronic illnesses, is the fact that uh, one statistic came out that said babies are surviving. They are. Uh, more and more babies are surviving. And what we mean by that is if they were born early, not 40 weeks, they are surviving, but they have chronic illnesses. And many of those 1,500 which you have at START, which we have at any of the high schools here in mm -hmm. the greater area, uh, they have chronic illnesses. But there, there is homework that needs to be done by mm -hmm. you. There is homework that needs to be done. There is paperwork that needs to be filled yes. out by parents in order to allow you to do your job. Yes? Correct. Absolutely. We work very, very closely with the physicians or their health care providers and along with their parents. Many times parents come in and will say, this is how I do it at home, yeah. and they're very helpful. But you're right, we have all the paperwork. We have to get that all in line. We can't administer any medications without a physician's order and no over-the-counter medications without a physician's order. So it does. It takes a lot of work trying to get everything lined up, especially the beginning of the school year and you're trying to look at all the immunizations but for students that have diabetes we have to get all those emergency plans in place all the individual health plans in place we have to get that disseminate that information disseminated to all the teachers who are involved many times it takes training of bus drivers you know that student mm -hmm. with diabetes needs to go on the bus. A lot, oftentimes, especially if they're younger kids, we check their blood sugars, make sure it's okay, get them on the bus ride home. Last thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, we have left in the dust two weeks of school, three mm -hmm. weeks of school for some of these school districts because of Mother Nature. How much are you seeing parents, students coming to school or telling their kids to come to school when they're not feeling well because they've lost so many days? Is that going on? It is going on. I talk to parents daily who say they need to be in school. A lot of times they have headaches, we lay them down, school nurse is there, we can do a good assessment. If they're not contagious, we lay them down, get them comfortable. Um, sometimes I have the parents bring them in some medication, get them comfortable and get them back to class because that is the goal is to keep them in school so they can learn. But have, have you been told? I mean, is that a mandate that's been told of you that this is a, this is a, oh, no. this has got to be a well working machine, but it's just an no. understanding that yeah. we all are obvious school. to it. it. We're not oblivious to the fact we've right. lost so many days. Right. Denise, no. thank you so much for spending some time with us. Good conversation. We appreciate thank it. You. Father Anytime. Ronald, Father Ronald Olszewski joins us on the other side of this commercial break. Stay with us here on the round table.